people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. 1972, Washington, D.C. police arrest five burglars with political connections at the highest levels. I said we had nothing to do with this foolishness. We had no idea it would reach into the White House. Well, I'm not a crook. I had become the desk officer for the cover-up. The president is under fire. What did the president know, and when did he know it? It was him or, or us. Either he was right or we were right. The questions and answers. The story behind the Watergate scandal. Washington, D.C., May 28, 1972. A presidential election is less than six months away. Tonight, five burglars meet outside the sprawling Watergate complex with a simple plan. Break into the Democratic National Committee headquarters on the sixth floor. This raises the first of many questions to be investigated and answered by the final report. What are the burglars looking for? This is a crew largely comprised of Cuban-Americans, ex-CIA agents flown in from Miami. They're on assignment for Howard Hunt, a former CIA operative, and G. Gordon Liddy. Both men work for the committee to re-elect President Richard Nixon. When we chose them, we went through their CIA training files. They all had done very well. They were remarkable guys. These are good people. In a Gallup poll released May 1st, President Nixon has a double-digit lead over his likely Democratic opponent, Senator George McGovern of South Dakota. You give us back our country. Considering the president's lead, why do members of the committee to re-elect the president resort to illegal tactics? Midnight, Hunt and Liddy wait at the Watergate Hotel while a locksmith on the burglar's crew opens the front door of the Democratic National Committee offices. Minutes later, he radios Hunt with the code message, the horse is in the house. Translation, the men are inside. 1.30 a.m., the team's electronics expert wiretaps two of the office phones. A few minutes later, the five men exit the building undetected. Hunt and Liddy plant another man, Alfred Baldwin, an ex-FBI agent, at the Howard Johnson Motor Lodge across the street. Baldwin has his orders. Listen in on conversations at the Democratic National Committee office and write down anything he hears. For the next 20 days, he monitors the wiretaps. What does the Nixon campaign hope to learn? Three weeks after the break-in, June 17th, Hunt and Liddy gather their team at the Watergate Hotel again. They tell the men that one of the bugs is defective. Their assignment is to fix it tonight. Each man knows his job. Baldwin will be the lookout at the Howard Johnson across the street, while the burglars replace the bug at the DNC headquarters. Hunt and Liddy will keep in radio contact from their room at the Watergate Hotel. 1 a.m. After the last Democratic National Committee volunteer leaves, the crew enters the stairwell of the Watergate parking garage. The locksmith picks the lock on the building. Another man tapes the door open, and they enter. They took tape, taped it across the spring-loaded lock so that it would not engage, and they could just bump their way in with their hip in and out. The burglars walk up to the sixth floor to the DNC offices. 1.50 a.m. In the parking garage, security guard Frank Wills notices the tape on the stairwell door. He immediately calls the police. Why does the tape door cause such concern? Three off-duty officers pull up outside the water gate in an unmarked car. From his lookout post across the street, Baldwin studies the men. They are casually dressed and do not appear suspicious. Then Baldwin sees a light go on in the building. He tries to warn the burglars, but it's too late. 
Inside, the police arrest the five men at gunpoint. One of the burglars radios G. Gordon Liddy. And then finally, we heard them. And what he said was, they got us. Police find almost $2,300 in sequential bills on the burglars. They suspect money laundering or counterfeiting and turn the case over to the FBI. Hunt and Liddy exit the Watergate Hotel discreetly. They drive away unnoticed. The next morning, the story of the break-in falls to two low-ranking reporters at the Washington Post, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. Ben Bradley, the executive editor, puts the local story on the front page. It was a slow day. It was Sunday. It was a police story, and uh, the only thing that made it interesting was the uh, fact that it was at the Democratic National Committee. But it doesn't generate much attention. In fact, the Washington Bureau of CBS News assigns the Watergate story to a young reporter named Leslie Stahl. I had just been hired, so I was the real rookie in the Bureau. I think that they sent me to cover this was a measure of how insignificant they really did think the story was. June 19th. A day later, Woodward and Bernstein land a story on the front page. The article links the break-in to the committee to re-elect the president. One of the arrested burglars, James McCord, is the committee's security coordinator. That same day, a Post reporter on the police beat calls Woodward with a tip. The burglars left behind two address books and a check from Howard Hunt in their hotel room at the Watergate. Hunt's initials are scrawled inside next to the initials WH, which Woodward learns stands for White House. The reporter quickly dials the White House and asks for Hunt. Hunt no longer works there, but Woodward tracks him down. Woodward said, Mr. Hunt, we want to ask you why your name is in the address book of one of the burglars. And the next uh, thing the Hunt said was, oh, my God. That night aboard Air Force One, Chief of Staff Bob Haldeman tells President Nixon that one of the Watergate burglars is James McCord, an employee at the committee to re-elect the president. Nixon writes in his memoirs, quote, I could not muster much moral outrage over a political bugging. June 20th, the Washington Post runs a page one story linking former White House consultant Howard Hunt to the Watergate burglars. The article also reports that until a few months ago, Hunt had worked for presidential aide Charles Colson. After seeing Colson's name in the paper, Nixon is now horrified that one of his closest aides has been publicly connected to the burglary. As Nixon's legal counsel, Colson is a member of the president's inner circle, a group that includes Nixon's chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman, and his top domestic policy advisor, John Ehrlichman. For their zealous protection of the president, Haldeman and Ehrlichman are nicknamed the Berlin Wall. 2.20 p.m. Nixon calls Charles Colson into the Oval Office. Colson says that at this point, he has no reason to suspect that the White House is involved in Watergate. I walked in and said, this is one of those times, Mr. President, when you want everybody to testify because we had nothing to do with this foolishness. But the meeting with Colson does little to calm the president, in part because he considers members of the press his political enemies. A block away, Jack Nelson has the White House beat for the LA Times. He knows the president is highly suspicious of others. He was paranoid, and um, um, people who covered him knew that. I don't think that that image of him necessarily was out in the country, but it was certainly among the people who covered him. What is Nixon paranoid about? Publicly, the White House dismisses the break-in as a, quote, third-rate burglary. Privately, the president's closest aides worry the press will dig deeper. What are Nixon's aides concerned that the press will find? Haldeman and Ehrlichman have faithfully executed Nixon's wishes since the early 1960s. But in the coming months, President Nixon will begin to publicly question his own inner circle. There had been an effort to conceal the facts, both from the public, from you, and from me. 
Nixon's struggle to contain the Watergate scandal and the answers to our questions when the final report continues. Washington, D.C., 1972. President Richard Nixon's re-election campaign is underway, as is an FBI investigation into a break-in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters. The story initially receives little coverage. In less than three weeks, the Watergate story all but disappears from the media. I remember once saying to Bob Woodward, who was my friend, I have to get off this story. This is not good for my young career at CBS. And he said, don't get off it. Trust me, don't get off it. July 10th, Alfred Baldwin, the lookout during the Watergate break-in, approaches the FBI. He reveals that after the botched burglary, he contacted members of the committee to re-elect the president for guidance, but received none. Baldwin decided to come forward because he, quote, had been disowned by the committee. Baldwin tells the FBI that Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy directed the Watergate burglary on behalf of the committee to re-elect the president. Baldwin agrees to testify and is never charged. September 15th. Based on Baldwin's information, a federal grand jury indicts the five Watergate burglars, as well as Liddy and Hunt. October 9th. Washington Post reporter Bob Woodward arranges a late-night meeting with a confidential source he's known for many years. Woodward takes great pains to avoid being followed. He switches cabs on the way to the rendezvous point, column 32, in this parking garage in Roslyn, Virginia. The man tells Woodward that employees of the committee to re-elect the president were not only behind the Watergate break-in, but that they're deeply involved in all kinds of political sabotage against Nixon's enemies. Back in the Washington Post newsroom, Woodward refuses to reveal the name of his anonymous source. His colleagues nicknamed the unknown man Deep Throat. The intrigue surrounding him raises one of the many questions that we'll answer in the final report. How important is Deep Throat to the Watergate story? October 10th, Woodward's article hits the front page. The public learns that Watergate was just one of many surveillance operations directed by the president's re-election campaign. Inside the White House, President Nixon follows the newspaper's coverage. Does the White House know who's leaking information to the Washington Post? November 7th, Election Day. President Richard Nixon carries 49 states, all but Massachusetts, in the largest electoral landslide in American history. January 8, 1973. The five Watergate burglars and the men behind the scheme, G. Gordon Liddy and Howard Hunt, appear in federal district court. Hunt pleads guilty to six charges, including conspiracy and wiretapping. The following week, four of the five burglars follow suit and enter guilty pleas. Burglar James McCord and Liddy both plead not guilty. They refuse to discuss whether anyone higher up is involved. The judge on the case, John Sirica, suspects a deeper conspiracy. He grills the burglars on whether the White House played a role. I had very little courtroom experience by that time in my career. And I kept saying to people around me, is that unusual? And they said, yep, that's unusual. Judge Sirica asked the men one more question. Who's paying the burglars' legal bills? The men say they don't know. January 20th, Richard Nixon takes the presidential oath of office for his second term. It is just two months until the last American combat troops withdraw from Vietnam. As America's longest and most difficult war comes to an end, let us again learn to debate our differences with civility and decency. The president adds John Dean to his inner circle. He asks the young attorney to manage the Watergate scandal by controlling the flow of information in and out of the White House. After Nixon wins his landslide victory, uh, 
he's not quite sure what is going to happen with Watergate, but he's quite sure what he wants to have happen. He wants it ended. I, in essence, had become the desk officer for the cover-up. January 30th, the jury in Lydian McCord's Watergate trial finds them both guilty of conspiracy, burglary, and wiretapping. But the trial ends without any proof of a larger conspiracy. Judge Sirica urges the U.S. Senate to look deeper into Watergate, saying, quote, I am still not satisfied that the pertinent facts have been produced before an American jury. February 7th, the Senate creates a committee to determine if Richard Nixon's last campaign involved illegal activity. They also hope to answer the question, did President Nixon play any role in the Watergate break-in? March 23rd, at the sentencing hearing of all the Watergate conspirators, Judge Sureka reads a letter in open court from James McCord, one of the burglars. McCord says, quote, there was political pressure applied to the defendants to plead guilty and remain silent. This letter hints at a larger conspiracy and ignites national interest in Watergate. April 6th, John Dean, the young White House counsel, approaches Senate investigators. Dean is convinced that the Watergate cover-up is spiraling out of control. He offers to tell them everything he knows. April 17th, the president, aware that Dean is talking to the Watergate investigators, no longer trusts him. In a private meeting, Nixon asks Dean to resign. He then passes me a letter across his desk uh, where he's got it drafted, and it's just a, a, an open confession. Nixon tells Dean that he is also planning to remove his top aides, Haldeman and Ehrlichman. Dean knows that the two men are also involved in the cover-up, yet he suspects that he will be the president's lone fall guy. This isn't an acceptable role for me. And I said, well, I'd like to have a letter that says that Haldeman and Ehrlichman are resigning as well. April 29th, Camp David, Maryland. In what he calls one of the most difficult decisions of his career, Richard Nixon asked Haldeman and Ehrlichman for their resignations. In his memoirs, the president writes that he told the men, quote, when I went to bed last night, I had hoped and almost prayed that I wouldn't wake up this morning. The next day, the president tells the nation that he now believes his own staff was involved in the Watergate cover-up. There had been an effort to conceal the facts, both from the public, from you, and from me. Why does Nixon decide to dismiss his closest aides? May 17th, the Senate Watergate hearings begin. All three commercial networks air the hearings live. The hearings dominated this town. They had this town by the throat. You wouldn't date anybody that didn't want to talk about this. There'd be no point. The next day, Attorney General Elliot Richardson appoints Archibald Cox as special prosecutor and orders him to explore the president's connection to Watergate. Nixon is now facing both a criminal probe from the Justice Department and a political inquiry in the Senate. 38 days later, the one-time close aide to the president, John Dean, is set to testify before the Senate Watergate Committee. But it became clear once he decided to testify, he was gonna let it all hang out. That shocking testimony and the answers to all of our questions are next on The Final Report. June 25th, 1973, Washington, D.C. A standing room only crowd waits for President Nixon's former legal counsel, John Dean, to testify in front of the Senate Watergate Committee. The counsel will call the first witness, Mr. John W. Dean III. I sincerely wish I could say it's my pleasure to be here today, but I think you can understand why it's not. For almost eight hours, Dean reads a 245-page statement before a national TV audience. He outlines what the president called, quote, his dirty tricks campaign. The revised domestic intelligence plan called for bugging, burglarizing. People at home watching it live on television were just glued. June 28th, Republican Senator Howard Baker asked Dean the question on everyone's mind. 
the central question at this point is simply put, what did the president know and when did he know it? July 16th, the committee calls the president's little known deputy assistant, Alexander Butterfield. Republican counsel Fred Thompson is the first to question him. Mr. Butterfield, are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? I was aware of listening devices. Yes, sir. What prompts the committee to ask about listening devices in the Oval Office? I was sitting next to Mary McGrory, a famous Washington reporter. I said, did I hear right? Did I hear right? If there are tapes, oh my goodness. What, 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 what has Nixon said on the tapes? You understand the problem we have here. The news of the secret taping shocks the president's staff. I felt betrayed because the whole idea of being able to be an advisor to the president is that you can talk candidly to the president. Why is the president taping his conversations? Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox plans to subpoena the White House tapes. But he doesn't for another week. Until then, Richard Nixon is not obligated to turn them over. He could have had a bonfire on the White House lawn and burned them and could have gotten away with it. Why doesn't Nixon destroy the tapes? July 23rd, Cox subpoenas the tapes. Nixon refuses to release them for months. October 20th. In a desperate move, the president orders Attorney General Elliot Richardson to fire the special prosecutor. Richardson and his deputy refuse to do it. They resign instead. Finally, the Solicitor General, Robert Bork, agrees to fire Cox. The press calls the event the Saturday Night Massacre. The firing spark anger around the country. There's talk in Washington that the president might face impeachment if he continues to stonewall the investigation. Nixon staff catalogs and transcribes the tapes. November 21st, the administration announces there's a problem. The White House says that when Nixon's secretary, Rosemary Woods, was transcribing the tapes, she accidentally erased an 18 and a half minute section. She reenacts the moment in a move the press instantly terms, the Rosemary stretch. Was the tape deliberately erased? February 6th, 1974. Nixon has dodged federal subpoenas for six months. The House of Representatives, by a vote of 410 in favor to four opposed, instructs the Judiciary Committee to consider articles of impeachment. April 30th, Nixon releases edited transcripts of the White House tapes to the public. The tapes themselves are not released, but Americans are surprised by the president's vulgar language. There were these parties where, if transcripts came out, we would sit in a circle and read them out loud. They were filled with expletive deleted and things, so there'd be a lot of laughter. July 24th, the US Supreme Court orders Richard Nixon to release the White House tapes was the knockout blow. If we didn't have the tapes, I don't know whether we would have gotten them or not. He hung himself, really, with his own tape, which is the, one of the tragedies of Watergate. Of all the tapes, a recording from June 23, 1972, is the most devastating. The press labels it the smoking gun because it proves that the president obstructed justice six days after the break-in. In a meeting on that day with his chief of staff, Nixon says that an FBI investigation would expose the burglars, since four of them are former CIA agents involved in the failed 1961 Bay of Pigs operation in Cuba. Nixon tells Haldeman to call CIA director Richard Helms and persuade the agency to halt the FBI probe using a cover story. In this conversation, the President of the United States is telling his chief of staff to interfere with the Watergate investigation. This is a clear violation of the law. 
But CIA Director Helms refuses to go along with Nixon's plan. July 27th. The House Judiciary Committee passes an article of impeachment against the president for obstruction of justice. Within three days, Congress passes two more articles of impeachment, one for abuse of power and another for contempt of Congress. Mr. Drinan. Aye. Mr. Rangel. Aye. The full House is scheduled to address the articles in two weeks. With the threat of impeachment looming, what is the president's state of mind? Nine days later, on August 8, 1974, Nixon addresses the nation. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. America needs a full-time president and a full-time Congress. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. By resigning, he avoids a likely impeachment and trial in the Senate. Would the Senate have removed Nixon from office? More than three decades after Watergate, questions remain. As we examine them, we reveal the larger conspiracy, hidden agendas, and a president's desperate struggle to survive. Our answers begin with the break-in at the Watergate. What were the burglars looking for? One theory is that they wanted information on Democratic National Committee Chairman Larry O'Brien. O'Brien, at the time, was giving the White House fits. He was probably the most visible and vocal spokesperson for the Democratic Party, and he is a threat to the, the, the president. But at the time, O'Brien and the Democrats did not pose a major threat. Nixon held a double-digit lead over Democratic candidate George McGovern. So why did members of the Committee to Re-elect the President resort to illegal tactics? Nixon didn't just want to win the election, he wanted to win big. That's what some people don't know about Nixon. He wanted to win the election by the greatest margin ever in a presidential election. To help achieve a landslide over the Democrats in November, the committee hired a former FBI agent and current White House staff assistant, G. Gordon Liddy. Liddy's job was simple gather intelligence on Richard Nixon's enemies. The committee gave Liddy a budget of $250,000 and permission to break into the Democratic National Committee headquarters. Liddy brought in former CIA operative Howard Hunt to help him carry out the mission. Nixon set the tone for his re-election committee. He was a man driven by mistrust and anger. What was Nixon paranoid about? He worried that his enemies and leaks to the press would undermine his international agenda. When Nixon took office in 1969, he inherited the Vietnam War, which deeply divided the nation. Nixon didn't want to tarnish his legacy by being the first president to lose a war. It couldn't have been a more dangerous time. There were times when I would stand there on the White House lawn and wonder, can this country survive? June 13, 1971. The New York Times published the so-called Pentagon Papers, top secret documents that showed the government's calculated expansion of the war in the years leading up to the Nixon administration. Nixon believed their disclosure threatened national security. Daniel Ellsberg, a former military analyst, stole the papers from a think tank and leaked them. Nixon called it, quote, the most massive leak of classified documents in American history. We didn't know what else he had. And I was in the president's office one moment when he said, uh, Chuck, we've got to do whatever it takes to stop this man. In response, Nixon created a special investigations unit and called them the plumbers because they were hired to stop leaks. Their first target was Daniel Ellsberg. He would be the first of many to come into the president's line of fire. The White House goes on the attack and more answers to our questions next. <laughs>
when the final report continues. June 13th, 1971. Anti-war activist Daniel Ellsberg leaked top-secret Pentagon documents to the New York Times. President Nixon's surveillance team, known as the Plumbers, were instructed to gather any information on Ellsberg, including his file at his psychiatrist's office. And we thought he may have said to the psychiatrist what else he had and what he intended to do with it. September 3rd, Labor Day weekend. Acting under direct orders from the White House, Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy hired Cuban-American ex-CIA agents to break into Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office in Beverly Hills, California. But they didn't find his file. Eight months later, some of the same burglars from the Ellsberg job entered the Watergate. This time, they're acting on behalf of the committee to re-elect the president. After bugging the DNC offices, Alfred Baldwin, the lookout, monitored the conversations from across the street. What did they hope to learn? They wanted advanced knowledge of DNC campaign tactics. The mission was a failure. Baldwin took detailed notes, but he was mostly eavesdropping on office gossip among secretaries. Worse yet, the bug on DNC chairman Larry O'Brien's phone was defective. 20 days later, Liddy sent his team back into the Watergate. James McCord, the security coordinator at the committee to re-elect the president, entered the Watergate garage's stairwell and taped open the door to the building. McCord assumed that the security guard would see the tape, but that it would not surprise him. That's because the cleaning staff typically tape doors open as a matter of convenience. It was so much easier when they're carrying all these buckets and rooms and mops and things to be able to just bump it open with their hip. We saw that and we emulated that. Security guard Frank Wills did see the tape, but he removed it and continued his rounds. Less than an hour later, Wills noticed the door had been re-taped. Now he called the police. Why did the tape door cause such concern? The security guard knew the cleaning staff had gone home for the night. I didn't know that. The guard did know that. In the months that followed, the press focused on the Watergate burglars and their connection to Nixon's re-election committee. What were Nixon's aides concerned the press would find? Their worst fear was that the Watergate conspirators would expose the White House sanctioned break-in of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office. They couldn't have survived the fact that uh, these are the same guys that were operatives of the White House. Nixon's inner circle was less concerned about the DNC break-in. They were more worried about what the burglars might say to police about the Ellsberg job. June 20th, just three days after the break-in, Nixon met with his chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman, in the old executive office building. Eighteen and a half minutes of that conversation are missing from the White House taping system. Was the tape deliberately erased? Yes, it seems likely, because it was erased as many as nine different times. As for the gap's contents, Chief of Staff Bob Haldeman's handwritten notes indicate it was the first discussion of the Watergate cover-up with Nixon. He wrote that the president, quote, feels we should be on the attack for diversion and not just take it lying down. As the White House tried to quash the Watergate story, a young Washington Post reporter was digging deeper. On October 9, 1972, Bob Woodward headed to an underground parking garage and met his confidential source, who for years was known only as Deep Throat. How important was Deep Throat to the Watergate story? The mystery surrounding his identity exaggerated his significance, but his role was critical. Throughout the fall of 1972, Woodward returned to Deep Throat for new leads. In exchange, Woodward protected the identity of his source. It would be more than 30 years before his identity was revealed as Mark Felt, associate director of the FBI. Washington Post executive editor Ben Brantley tells the final report that Felt's interactions with Woodward were infrequent, but powerful. There were 400 stories involved in uh, Watergate, and Felt wasn't the source of every one of them. But uh, 
He was an invaluable source, and that's the end of it. After the Watergate break-in, Felt started to build a case against the burglars. He wanted to expand his investigation into Nixon's, quote, dirty tricks campaign. But the White House continued to undermine his efforts. Felt was frustrated and urged Woodward to dig deeper. Did the White House know who was leaking information to the Washington Post? The White House suspected it was Mark Felt. When J. Edgar Hoover died in May 1972, Nixon snubbed Felt by appointing an outsider, Patrick Gray III, to replace Hoover. Chief of Staff Bob Haldeman pegged Mark Felt and shared his thoughts with Nixon on October 19, 1972. The president was powerless to stop Mark Felt. Nixon knew that if he revealed Woodward's source, Felt could go public with his information. On January 15, 1973, Judge John Sirica dealt Nixon another blow by asking the Watergate burglars if the White House was involved. The men said no. Sirica then wanted to know who was paying the burglars legal bills. The committee to re-elect the president paid the burglars directly out of Nixon's campaign funds. The so-called hush money kept the burglars quiet for a while, but the committee faced the prospect of ongoing payoffs to guarantee their silence in the future. Nixon's legal counsel, John Dean, knew the Watergate cover-up was out of control. These men are not going to remain silent forever, and the investigations are not going to go away. I said, somebody's got to really go in and blow this whole thing up with the president. March 21st, 10:12 a.m. In a private meeting that lasted nearly two hours, Dean told Richard Nixon the cycle of so-called hush money would never end. April 29th, the president ousted the key players, including John Dean, Bob Haldeman, and John Ehrlichman. Why did Nixon decide to dismiss his closest aides? He hoped to salvage his presidency by cutting all ties to anyone linked to Watergate. Stanley Cutler, a Nixon historian, tells the final report that the dismissals backfired. Nixon takes steps like this in the hopes that the problem will go away. But it doesn't, because all it does is peel off another layer and make him more vulnerable. Nixon now faced the scandal alone. His last stand and the conclusion to the final report are next. July 1973, more than a year after the Watergate break-in, what was once dismissed as a third-rate burglary became the focus of Senate hearings televised live nationwide. July 16th, former presidential aide Alexander Butterfield told the Senate committee that Nixon had a hidden taping system. What prompted the committee to ask about listening devices in the Oval Office? A Senate committee staffer stumbled upon the information. Before Butterfield could appear in front of the committee, he had to sit through a round of questioning. The committee staffers were looking for written or recorded evidence of Nixon's involvement. And I held him off for four and a half hours. Finally, a guy asked me the direct question, and I said, yes, I'm sorry you asked me that question, but the answer is yes, there were listening devices. Why was Nixon taping his conversations? The taping system was for his memoirs. Since Franklin Delano Roosevelt 
presidents had secretly recorded conversations in the Oval Office. Nixon installed the most extensive system of microphones and wiretaps to date. When the taping system was revealed, the president could have erased the tapes because they belonged to him. Why didn't Nixon destroy the tapes? He intended to erase the most sensitive recordings, but never did. In July 1973, Butterfield revealed the existence of the taping system. At the time, the president was in the hospital with bronchial pneumonia. He turned to his former chief of staff, Bob Haldeman, for help. Leonard Garman, Nixon's legal counsel, says that Haldeman was the only person who had intimate knowledge of the recordings, including the March 21st conversation in which John Dean referred to a, quote, cancer on the presidency. Haldeman weighed in on the side of of keeping the tapes. He thought that that conversation and presumably other conversations that he knew about would help the president rather than hurt him. July 1974, the House Judiciary Committee passed the third and final article of impeachment. It appeared that the full House would vote in favor of impeachment, prompting a trial in the Senate. But if the Senate voted to acquit him of all charges, he could serve out his term. Would the Senate have removed Nixon from office? Yes, even members of his own party were poised to remove him. On August 7th, Republican Senator Barry Goldwater visited the White House with a sobering message for the president. Nixon did not have the votes to avoid a conviction by the necessary two-thirds majority in the Senate. It was uh, Barry Goldwater and two other top Republicans who went to him essentially and told him, Mr. President, the jig's up. With impeachment looming, what was the president's state of mind? He was moody, unstable, and at times appeared suicidal. Nixon met with his chief of staff, General Alexander Haig. The president knew Haig's military background and said, quote, you have a way of handling problems like this. Somebody leaves a pistol in the drawer. I don't have a pistol. August 8th, the president finally succumbs to the Watergate scandal. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. After delivering his resignation speech, the president stayed up until 1.30 a.m., wandering the halls of the White House and reflecting on the third-rate burglary that ended his career. More than two years after the event, the nation still wondered, did President Nixon play any role in the Watergate break-in? There is no clear evidence linking him to the planning or execution of the actual burglary. However, he created the plumber's unit and tacitly approved covert operations that led to Watergate. And his repeated demands for information on his enemies inspired the break-in. The decision to go into the Watergate is the result of any number of conversations that Nixon has with his immediate staff saying, we've got to get more stuff on them. On August 9, 1974, Richard Nixon said goodbye to the White House, leaving one huge question behind. What did the president know, and when did he know it? Nixon's crime was the Watergate cover-up, which he orchestrated. In the final report, it's clear that Watergate dramatically eroded the power and prestige of the presidency. After Watergate, Congress took a series of steps to counteract Nixon's policies. It voted to cut the president's post-war funding of the South Vietnamese government, leading to the fall of Saigon. It overrode Nixon's veto to pass the War Powers Act, which restricted the president's ability to unilaterally enter a prolonged military conflict. And in hopes of preventing similar scandals, it required candidates to disclose their campaign funds. My fellow Americans, our long national nightmare is over. One month after Nixon resigned, President Gerald Ford pardoned him. Many saw it as a way to finally move beyond the scandal. Two years later, the Republicans lost the White House to Democratic outsider Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter. He pledged a new era of honesty in the White House. 
In 1994, Richard Nixon died at the age of 81. Every living former president attended his funeral. Watergate returned to public consciousness in May 2005. After 33 years of secrecy, an ailing Mark Felt decided to reveal that he was Bob Woodward's source, Deep Throat. Despite a 28-year career in politics, Nixon's name will forever be linked with one word, Watergate. What is a textbook that involves American history? What is it going to say about Richard Nixon? Whatever that book says, it will begin with the following sentence. Richard Nixon, comma, the first president of the United States to resign because of scandal. Three years after resigning, Nixon revealed to an interviewer, quote, I let the American people down, and I have to carry that burden with me for the rest of my life.